In this video, I'm going to show you how to fill out a financial affidavit. Um, so in Connecticut, there's two financial affidavit forms. There's one for, there's a short form and a long form, depending on how much uh, your income is and how much you earn in assets. Um, but I generally have my clients fill out the long form regardless of what their financial circumstances are, just because it's a more detailed form. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and we can go over the form. So at the top, you just fill out the docket number, the judicial district where your case is, um, your the address of the court, the name of the case. So the name of the plaintiff first, the name of the defendant. And this is just the name of whoever's filling out the financial affidavit and put plaintiff or defendant. Um, so on the form in general, everything in Connecticut, they generally break uh, income and expenses. They break all the finances into weekly figures, which is a little counterintuitive. Usually people are used to working in monthly or um, annual numbers, but for these forms, it's all based on weekly. Um, so the, the way to break it down into weekly is if you are working on an annual basis. So if you're taking your annual income, you divide it by 52. Or if you are, if you think about your monthly expenses, so like a monthly utility bill, for example, you will take that number, you'll take the monthly amount, you'll multiply it by 12 to come up with the annual amount, and then you'll divide that number by 52 to break it down into the weekly amount. So the top section of the form is income. Uh, so you're just going to put how often you're paid. So weekly, biweekly, monthly, semi-monthly. That, that doesn't mean that you put a month. If you check off the monthly box, it does not mean that you put a monthly figure down here. This is just the frequency with which you are paid. Um, and honestly, it's not that important. So um, then here is your employer. Um, so you put your one employee, obviously, if you have multiple employers, you put them down here. And generally speaking, if you run out of room, you know, if there's, let's say you have four jobs, you can put additional information, you can just write it on a separate piece of paper, you know, put a Word document together, and you can put a little addendum on there. So you're going to write your employer and the address of the employer, whether you are, you know, salary if you're at, you have an annual salary or wages if you're paid by the hour and then you're going to calculate the weekly number now the form says uh computed based on year to date but no less than 13 weeks so i don't find that particularly helpful let's i i think how you want to do the form is just based on, you want to base it on what your current financial circumstances are and what your current projected income is. You know, a lot of people will earn, you know, let's say you've got a, a job where you're like a teacher, for example, and you only get paid 10 months out of the year. Now, if you're only, if you're not paid during the summer and you make this financial affidavit in September, for example, and you don't have any income from the last few months, you, putting your income at zero is not particularly helpful. Or, you know, let's say you get laid off, you get laid off consistently during a certain period of time. It's not helpful to have that. So I generally just try to estimate the weekly amount based on a annual projected income. So if you if you earn a similar amount of money every year, but you know you earn a lot more during a certain period of the year, or you earn a lot less, you want to kind of average it out. Or using the last 13 weeks isn't particularly helpful if you recently received a raise, for example. So if you went from $80,000 a year to 100,000 you know, and your hundred thousand dollar, your that twenty thousand dollar raise was happened last week. It's not helpful to average the last thirteen weeks. You want to you want to put your income as um, what it is now, what you expect it to be. And you can, if there's any like inconsistencies, you know, you can 
if you have to do further explanation, you can fill it in in the box up here. You can you can type out a narrative um, that kind of explains things further. So again, you really want to base this off of what your situation is now or what you expect it to be average throughout the year. Um, another example is bonuses. Like let's say you earn a bonus every January and you're filling this out in July. It's not, you know, that bonus wasn't within the last 13 weeks or it might not even be year to date. Let's say your, your bonus is in December and you're filling this out in July. This using this wouldn't be helpful. So on the bonus, you usually try to just average it out throughout the year. Um, so that's pretty much it on the income section. And then here, you're just going to put how many hours a week you earn. And then this is your income, your gross income from the prior tax year. And then on the deductions, um, you want to just average these out. You know, you want your deductions to reflect the deductions off of the uh, weekly income. So if you're an attorney and you're doing this, you can use the family law software to that's generally what I do is I use family law software based on, you know, how many kids a person is claiming, et cetera. That way, you know, because these numbers can be different if people have their withholding set up differently, but you really want these figures to reflect the taxes that a party is paying at the end of the year, um, rather than reflecting their withholdings. Because, you know, somebody could over withhold and then get a, massive tax refund every year but if they're over withholding this will you know it'll artificially deflate their net weekly income so you really want to base it off of what the actual taxes are rather than what the withholdings are uh, and again this breaks down what all the deductions are you know, the standard ones are federal income taxes, social security, state income taxes, and Medicare. And then often people will have health insurance deductions, but sometimes there's union, union dues, um, child support or alimony, et cetera. And that will come, this form, if you're filling it out in Adobe, it'll automatically calculate the net weekly income. And then there's some additional deductions that are down here. Then below, below that is the expenses section. So again, you're gonna to wanna to break these expenses down into weekly figures. Um, and you know, it's all pretty self-explanatory. And then there's an other section where you can you know, type in any extra expenses and the total weekly amount. So below income and expenses is the liability section where you just put you know any credit card debt, tax debt, healthcare debt, et cetera. And you're just gonna wanna check off whether the debt is solely in your name or whether it's a joint debt, either joint with your spouse or joint with some other third party. Right here, this is where you put the, the balance that is due, the amount owed on the tax um the date the debt was incurred as well as the weekly payment on the debt um and then you know oftentimes people will take have credit card debt but they you know they pay it off every month so in that situation you know just put put whatever the debt is but you can put in you can put a little note next to it that says you know pay off monthly something like that And you can often, you know, I think there's another section on the bottom where you can list any additional financial information if any of this stuff needs further explanation. So that's the liabilities section. And then we get down into the assets. So for the assets, the, the first part is real estate. So you just put the address of any real estate, whether it's uh, solely owned, whether you this is a box if you own it with your spouse. And this box is if you own the property with any third party. And then put the estimated fair market value. Obviously on a house, you know, you might put the fair market value before you have an appraisal. So you, you don't, you know, just put your best guess, whether you pull that off of Zillow or you have some other information 
on the value of the house. You put whatever that estimate is. And then you put the, the, the mortgage amount that is owed. Uh, sometimes there's a second mortgage or a home equity line of credit. And then this form will automatically calculate the equity. So let's say house is worth 400,000 and there's a $300,000 loan. It'll automatically calculate the equity. And then for value of your interest, you're generally, you know, if you own a house with your spouse, um, you're generally going to want to put half the equity. Um, but, you know, if you own the house pre you know, before the marriage and you've only been married for a year or something, you might want to put all of the equity as the value of your interest. And, you know, your attorney, if you have an attorney, will go over uh, this figure. But, it, you know, getting the value of your interest section isn't particularly important. It's just most important to have the the actual figures as accurate as you can, because obviously you and your spouse may may disagree on the value of your interest. You know, you may think it's a 50-50 asset, whereas your spouse might think it's all theirs. Um, but so getting this part correct isn't the most important. It's just getting these other sections correct is important. And then obviously there's often, you know, parties may own multiple properties. So you put them in these lines. And if you run out of room, again, you can put it on a separate form. Below that, we've got motor vehicles. So it's the same thing where you put the year, make and model of the vehicle, the ownership, the value, the loan balance. It'll automatically calculate the equity. And then you put the value of your interest. Below are bank accounts, you know, checking, savings, CDs, etc. It's all pretty self-explanatory where you put the account number, uh, the ownership, the balance, and the value of your interest. And these numbers are constantly going to be fluctuating. Um, you know, obviously a checking account goes up and down daily. So it's never going to be perfect. You know, you'll fill out the form today and it's inaccurate a couple of days from now. But, um, you know, just put the figures down as best you can as far as accuracy. Then below is just an additional section for any stocks, bonds, mutual funds, bond funds. Um, we've got insurance, so you're gonna put uh, the insurance policy and then whether it's disability or life insurance, the company, the account number, the listed beneficiary, which is often a spouse. So here's one that people often mess up. So the current balance slash value. Now, most life insurance policies are term life insurance policies. And let's say it's a term life insurance policy that pays out $250,000 if you pass. You don't put $250,000 here because this is, this is the, um, this is the, supposed to be the cash value. So if you put the, the benefit value, the payout value upon death, it'll artificially inflate the, the asset that you have. So if you have a life insurance policy that pays out $250,000, you don't have a $250,000 asset. It doesn't have a cash value. Ooh. When it does have a cash value, that's usually a whole or universal life insurance policy. You put the cash value of the policy here if there is any cash value, but you do not put the, um, the payout amount upon your death. So that's the insurance and usually, you know, disability insurance policy is not going to have a cash value. Below that, you put any retirement plans. So, you know, 401k, IRA, Roth IRA. Just make sure if you, it's important to differentiate between an IRA or a Roth IRA, just because a Roth account is going to be after tax. So you're going to want to make sure that you clarify if it is a Roth account. Um, just so the court or your attorney knows that it's an after-tax account. Then you just put the name of the institution, the account number, the beneficiary, whether or not you're receiving payments, which usually you're not going to be unless you are retired, and then the value of the account. And again, this is going to constantly fluctuate. Hopefully, it's constantly going up, um, but 
you don't have to get it perfect. Just put your, your best estimate as far as the most recent value. Here's any business interests. Um, so you put the name of your business, the percent that you owe, own. You gotta be careful here on the value section. Um, almost always we put unknown, you know, you can't really type it in on the form. So you might have to hand write it in after, but you don't wanna put, you know, it's hard to know what a business is worth without getting a business valuation. So I would try to avoid putting a balance for the a value for the business, unless you've actually gone out and gotten a valuation. Um, we would generally want to fill this out as unknown because you know you might have a hundred thousand dollars in your business operating account. That doesn't mean your business is worth a hundred thousand dollars. It could be worth more, or it could be worth less. But if you, you know, put a figure here that isn't necessarily accurate, the attorney on the other side can use that against you in the future. They can, you know, if they if it turns out your business is worth $500,000 and you had put $100,000 because that's what you have in your business operating account, an opposing counsel can try to use that against you by saying, oh, you were lied about, you tried to lie about the value of your business in the past by only putting it at $100,000. So you want to avoid that unless you actually know what your business is worth through evaluation. Um, these are just other assets that you can you can put um you know cash and brokerage accounts funds in escrow um held by an attorney so if you you know if your attorney took a retainer from you and there's still money in that retainer you'd want to fill that out here these are other kind of personal property items um you're really it's tough to know exactly what these things are worth you know home furnishing so you can either put a best estimate don't don't put the value that you paid for it you know if you bought a couch for fifteen hundred dollars you can't sell it for fifteen hundred dollars so um you can just put an estimate or you can just put unknown if you don't know what the exact value is well, down here you fill out these are assets in the names of any children so chet accounts um any other kind of college funds, 529, et cetera. So you just put the institution, the account number, the beneficiary, which is usually gonna be your child, um, the person who controls the account, usually it's one of the parents, and then the current balance. Here you're just gonna put any health insurance company as well as the people who are insured. Um, so it might be you, your spouse, and your kids might be insured under the policy. Here you put whether you're receiving any Husky health insurance coverage. Um, and that's pretty much it. So down here, you put any additional information that you feel is relevant. As I mentioned before, you put in your contact info. And that, so this summary, this summary section, it will summarize based on the information that you fill out in the rest of the form the the adobe pdf form will automatically fill these sections so it'll create a little summary down here so those are the basics on how you fill out your financial affidavit if you have an attorney um you know just fill out the form as best you can and then send it to your attorney and you know they'll be able to review the form with you answer any questions that you have and make sure everything's done correctly